Hello, this is Ben with MeasureQuick, and today we'll be discussing a recent study published by the DOE. Is yeah. it published by the DOE? Yeah, by the Department yeah. of Energy. Yeah. And it has a wonderfully long title, which is Optimizing Residential HVAC Systems, Evaluating How the Usage of Smart Diagnostic Tools for Quality Installation and Commissioning Impacts System Performance in HVAC Contractor Businesses. The trick is to make you sound smarter than you are when you do when you publish research. It, but it's very clear what it's about. <laughs> and so why are we discussing this today is, is because at Measure Quick, we're kind of obsessed with quality installation, commissioning, smart tools, pretty much all the keywords in that title we like. But also, this study actually had a huge impact on the features that you might be using in Measure Quick. So Measure Quick 2.0 and Measure Quick 2.5 those were in development over the course of this study. And so the content in this little video here might give you some insights into what the, some of those features are that Jim had integrated from the feedback from this academic study published by the DOE. So I think you're going to find this really interesting. And part of the study is trying to quantify the impact of Measure Quick That's right. on HVAC businesses. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited to talk to you about it. I know that I had some time with Carolyn Hazard at the HVAC Symposium earlier this year, where I uh, co-presented with her. Uh, she talked about some of the preliminary results from this. But with me today is Brian Haynes, who is a technical principal at the South Face Institute. So welcome, Brian. Thank you so much for your time. And could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what a technical principal is? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I work at South Face and we are a nonprofit uh, based in Atlanta, Georgia. We've been around for about 40 years and <clears throat> we work in sustainability in the built environment. That means promoting energy and water efficiency and indoor air quality in residences, businesses, industrial facilities, and communities. How does the work that you do or that South Face does relate or interact or impact trades professionals that are doing residential mm -hmm. HVAC work? We promote sustainability through four areas. We're involved in research, advocacy, uh, technical assistance, and uh, education. And so we work with trades professionals all the time. We do trainings. Like, for instance, one that would be directly applicable is we have a, we call it a DET training, which is duct and envelope tightness training that specifically focuses on how to, how to make your duct system tighter and how to make your building envelope tighter. And it's very hands-on training with some technical background to it. That's where we really thrive. Our, our organization really thrives at having a good technical acumen and then applying it in a very boots on the ground, practical way. So we work directly with builders and with contractors doing trainings and doing certifications, green building certifications, and then also in a consulting sort of fee for service uh, aspect as well. Interesting. What kicked off this research project? Yeah, so this research project, we, we've been affiliated with the Department of Energy's Building America program for a number of years. Building America is a residential building science research program within the U.S. Department of Energy. Within the, specifically, it's the Building Technologies Office. And at any given time, there's about a dozen research groups around the country that are doing hands-on, practical, applied building science research funded by the Department of Energy. And usually it will be things like field validations of uh, new technologies. An example that people would be familiar with is Aero Barrier. Aero Seal had already, you know, gained some traction and Aero, Aero Barrier was a newer product and they did a field validation of Aero Barrier. So that's one, that's just an example people would know. We previously did a project on indoor air quality measurements and testing out newer low-cost indoor air quality sensors. So these would be indoor air quality sensors that are now commercially available, built into thermostats that you can buy. Me. Yeah, there you go. And they weren't really available at the time. A uh, number of years ago, we did some pioneering research with that and looking at how they can be used to measure indoor air quality and seeing if they can tell a difference between different types of ventilation, mechanical ventilation. So anyways, 
this project came up where we completed that project, the indoor air quality project. The Department of Energy was interested in some of these newer smart installation, verification, and commissioning technologies when it came to HVAC equipment. Yeah. And that was started how many years ago? Oh, <laughs> these <laughs> things last for lo always longer than you would like. Th this particular project with Measure Quick started back in, I think the discussion started back in 2018. And then we didn't actually start the project until I think 2019. And then as everyone knows, in spring of 2020 is when everything got thrown off, especially when you're trying to do a field validation of this new technology. And so we had to figure out ways around with COVID, ways around directly contacting customers and, and like, yeah, and a whole bunch of wrenches in the gears yeah. there. That, but that's interesting how it was a couple of years after the birth of Measure Quick. So yeah. it was like the conversation started with Measure Quick 1.0. And then since then it evolved into Measure Quick 2.0. Okay. And then I think it was about Measure Quick 2.5 that the study had was concluding with. Yeah. And, and that's been some of the fruit of the study is that some of the things that we found during the course of the study was integrated into newer versions of measure. So there's some built-in checks and features that catch and correct some of the errors that we found and how the tools were, were being used. Yeah, that's a great feedback loop. And what were the specific objectives of um, the program? Hmm. Uh, the goal with this project was looking at what are the energy HVAC performance impacts as well as what are the business impacts of uh, using a tool like MeasureQuick. In this case, it was MeasureQuick. It's just in the published report, you, yeah, you uh, anonymize things. We wanted to see what impact did using the MeasureQuick workflows have on retro commissioning or tuning up existing systems and how did it affect the installation of new systems? How, how did that compare to standard installation practices? And then on the business side, it was, does it increase the productivity of HVAC service contractors? How does it increase the reception of retro commissioning and uh, maintenance service agreements and, and those kind of things from uh, HVAC? There's a couple of challenges along the way. What were some of those challenges? Right. Well, those challenges, both with the energy impacts that we were looking at and then with the business impacts. I'll start with the kind of energy and HVAC performance impacts first. So with the energy and HVAC performance impacts, when we... We're looking at the data. What we discovered was that some of the data wasn't making sense. And it was like, okay, some of these numbers are just, just physically impossible. And so what we started doing was as we dug into it, we were like, okay, what we're actually seeing here is, is errors with deployment of the sensors themselves or errors with how technicians are using the app. Um, and so what we did was we uh, developed a number of different filters to filter out the ones that have identifiable app or tool usage errors. And then on the business side, some of the things we ran into were, we, we, what we wanted to do was collect real KPI or key, key performance indicator data from contractors. And whether it was because contractors weren't tracking that data or they had trouble exporting that data from their tracking systems, like Service Titan, that kind of thing, or they were just reticent to share it we didn't get solid data on that. And so what we had to do on the business impact side, and this was, I was involved more with the energy impact side and Car Carolyn was involved with the business impact side. She would have all the details on that, but I can tell you that in general, what she had to do was to resort to interviews and surveys and more qualitative data instead of quantitative. And what was the methodology that was used to obtain the data and perform the analysis? Yes, yeah, we, when we started out, because it was right at the start of COVID, what we were trying to do was cast as wide, wide of a night, as wide of a net as possible. And so we had two ways that we went about trying to gather data. One was sourcing data from at large contractors or what we called at-large contractors. And these were just self-selected individual technicians who responded to a recruiting email um, that we sent to the uh, general measure quick email list. And so it was open for a limited amount of time. And, and what they got was access to measure quick premier services for a year in exchange for sharing a copy of the measure quick snapshots that they took. 
The second group was what we called business practice partners. And so these were eight HVAC contractor companies. Technicians are all required to use the app in the field. It's integrated into their business. They shared both the HVAC MeasureQuick snapshots with us, as well as feedback on how MeasureQuick uh, affects their business practices. We uh, collected 12 months of data uh, between uh, 2021 and 2022. So it was a year after COVID is when we finally got everything rolling and started collecting data. But all this, all the planning was the right 2020 timeframe. What were some of the most surprising findings of the study? Is there a big deviation from what your initial hypotheses were versus the results? It's what we found along the way that was surprising. For instance, the rates of Bluetooth tool deployment errors were a lot higher than we were expecting. Like I mentioned before, we, when we started looking at the data, when it was coming in, where some of it wasn't making sense. And what we figured out was, okay, some of the tools just aren't being used correctly. Once we filtered out the tool usage errors, then the results made more sense. And, and, and we ended up with the results that we were looking for. But some examples of tool usage errors would be that it's not required to measure the air handler or condenser power to take a snapshot using MeasureQuick. And most technicians weren't doing that, and that's fine. What we found was that when they did attempt to do that, the rates in terms of measuring that power were in the range of like 10 to 18%. There are various reasons for that. And in some of those, we tried to try to build into MeasureQuick to avoid that happening in the future. And what's the knock-on impact of making those types of errors? When you uh, make those types of errors, air filters that we came up with, some of these aren't actually errors. We didn't want to look at residential systems or anything over five tons was filter out, filtered out, right? For instance, total external static pressure. If the reading was below 0.2 or above 2, there's a very good chance that it's just not being measured correctly. It's so low that it's not realistic that it was measured correctly, or it's so high that it's also not realistic. Things like swapping the liquid and suction line temperature clamps could be identified by looking at what the temperature that it's measuring. And then things like if there was an error in measuring the power, a lot of times we could see that because the air handler power is within 20% of the condensing unit power. And so a lot of times what happened is that the condenser power was being used as the air handler power or vice versa. And it was just Either it was being duplicated so that the overall power was either way too low or way too high. And to answer your original question, the outcome of measuring the power incorrectly is that the EER that MeasureQuick then presents is either unrealistically low or unrealistically high. And so then you're not able to actually diagnose the equipment correctly because you end up with a metric that doesn't make any sense. There's just so many pieces of data that has to be collected in MeasureQuick. The, the team has spent an exorbitant amount of time to automate as much of it as possible. User error is always still going to be possible, but I love how you can see how a lot of things in this table have resulted in changes to the software. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so a lot of these have been incorporated into the software now where you go to take a snapshot and it'll say something like, oh, it appears. It appears that you might have this probe out of place, that kind of thing. The highest uh, rates of error that we saw was this one, number six. So fan power error, it's measuring the fan power. And so whether it was measuring the wrong thing or having the cabinet open while you're trying to measure the fan power or there's various ways that it can go wrong, but it was roughly about 30 to 35% of snapshots that we saw if they were measuring fan power, they had readings that didn't make sense. This, we also did a couple of webinars a couple of months ago about the challenges with checklists. Mm -hmm. um, that's where my head is going with looking at this and discussing these challenges and all this data collection with some of the new incentive programs out there. Uh, some utilities are requiring checklists. Uh, as with a lot of energy programs, there's, there's often checklists involved, but if even using an app where it does like 60 to 80% of the heavy lifting for you, and there's still that much opportunity for uh, user error, it makes me reflect on the accuracy or the viability of using checklists for this procedure at all. Mm -hmm. Because 
what quality control do you have in a checklist that there's so many data points that unless you're recording them from two or three different angles with the camera, every single call, and then auditing all that information, how do you know what they actually did that it was done correctly? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that was one of the things that we looked at in the study is every snapshot that we used had to have live streamed probe data. It couldn't be manually entered. If anything was manually entered, we just threw it out because well, we wanted... User error. Yeah. 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 We, we, that was it's just such a large source of user error that any manual entry was automatically thrown out. And then even after that, just the tool usage errors is they're still decently high rates. I don't want it to sound extreme. I gave examples of the really high error rates, measuring power, static pressure, the rates of measuring that incorrectly were more in the range of like three to 4%. So it's a lot lower error rate, but it still exists. Was there any other really interesting findings uh, that you wanted to highlight that were res resulting from the study? That, you know, correct tool and app usage are essential for the full effectiveness of MeasureQuick. And therefore, training is extremely important. It's, you, you have to use it correctly. As Jim always says, garbage in is garbage out. So if you don't deploy the probes correctly, a lot of times just as you might as well have not deployed them in the first place. And then we found on average, the most difficult measurements for technicians to make were the power measurements. That There were a lot of uh, technicians not using the minimum number of probes to give meaningful results. As a result, there's a number of checks incorporated into MeasureQuick and also the guided workflows were added as uh, one of the options. Some of the, let me skip some of this stuff and go back to these. I actually want to go back to that oh, comment sure. you just talked about for guided workflows. Sure. So we have a challenge often when we're onboarding new customers. And it's very common for HVAC companies to have some form of customized checklists that they like to follow that they're comfortable with. It's what they've been doing for a while. It's what they've optimized to work with their use cases. So it makes sense that it'll be custom. Now it makes a lot more sense why Jim was so bullish in the guided workflows and saying that here's the linear path that mm -hmm. you have to go on is because we have an academic study published by the DOE that demonstrated how many errors are created if you have a choose your own adventure mentality for doing this type of work. Mm -hmm. There has to be guardrails around your around those procedures for installation, for maintenance, for service. Not only that, but if you don't use smart tools, then you are either going to have a high probability of error entering in the dozens, if not hundreds of pieces of information that you need to collect, or you just won't ever collect them. So both of those things are, are bad. And that's the whole point as to why Jim had uh, created this very narrow path mm -hmm. for technicians and, and HVAC companies to walk down is because the takeaways from this study were so impactful. If we wanted to improve the industry, we had to enforce those guardrails. So I just yeah. wanted to highlight that because we get a lot of people pushing back to say that, hey, these guided workflows or just the, the way that you want us to use MeasureQuick, it's not the way that works for us. Mm -hmm. It's the way that you're using the, you know, the way that you're implementing your processes for solving these problems might need a little bit more optimization. And so mm -hmm. I'd love to get more people reading the study. If I, you just read the executive the summary, summary, it's two pages and it gives all of the highlights. Here, I have some graphs. I like graphs. Okay, graphs so great. one of the uh, tables and graphs that shows a lot in one snapshot, which is the overall average change in percentage of normalized sensible capacity by installer group. So we have each of these BPPs, those are individual contractor companies. And then there's the at-large contractor group, which was self-selected individuals that responded to the MeasureQuick email. And then I have the overall average. And what this is showing is for contractors that were using the tune-up workflow and taking a test-in snapshot, test-out snapshot, we filtered the data to get rid of all the only a test in or only a test out or any of the errors that I previously mentioned, all those were filtered out. After filtering for identifiable errors, there was an average 5.4% improvement in normalized sensible capacity. And that's across 629 test in, test out 
usage uses of measure quick. And the T test P value just shows the really small value for that shows that as a statistically significant uh, value. We're pretty confident in that number. Uh, the things to keep in mind with this is that this was unsupervised. These are technicians using it. And so we don't what corrective action, if any, they did before and after the snapshot. So if you look at this contractor group, their average was effectively zero. Assumption that I would make is there wasn't anything done between the test in and test out. Maybe what they did was recommended a replacement or something like that. But really the important thing to see here is that using the workflow for the tune-up workflow, the ceiling is really high. The average from this group was 15 and a half percent improvement, but it's also can be, you can also have zero improvement. So it's really uh, dependent on what the company and the individual technician do as a result of the test. What do you see when you test? And then what are the necessary improvements, changes, tune-ups? Uh, if the average is five and a half percent or so, but the uh, ceiling is quite high. If you find a system that's performing well and do whatever corrective actions are needed, you can have really large improvement. Yeah, that range doesn't surprise me. The standard of care, which is another thing that Jim's been talking about more recently, is something that's not as standardized in yeah. HVAC compared to industries like healthcare, where the company has really strong sales goals or focuses on that hey, we're a replacement company. If you go in, you see any problems, quote a replacement. Yeah. Then a great sales tool in that regard. Mm -hmm. But that means the existing system won't get the upgrades. The other thing that we were looking at was how did it affect new installation performance, new systems. And the thing that we ran into here was that you need a baseline to compare it to. And what we're planning to do that hasn't worked out yet, but I think it'll still be possible to look at this in the future is that at the same time we were doing our study, there were two Building America field baseline studies uh, of HVAC performance and new install practices. And so the idea is to compare our numbers to what those studies are. Just look at general practice, how are new systems performing and how are existing systems performing. And those just didn't wrap up in time for us to use their data to compare it directly. Throughout our study, we'll say things like, okay, here's these numbers and these can be compared with the other Building America studies when they're published this year or next year, whenever that comes out. I'm just going to go over to the major takeaways from the new install measure quick data. And overall, what we found was what we were actually expecting. Once we filtered out the user errors, what we found was that the systems that were commissioned with MeasureQuick were performing pretty well. Overall, on average, they were performing at 90.5% of total normalized capacity, 94.2% of the normalized sensible capacity, and 0.55 total external static pressure and 195.6 CFM per ton. The one thing that was less than ideal was that only 76.9% um, of systems, 77% of systems had the correct charge. If you're looking at it on measure quick, all these metrics that we're measuring, if it's not showing the correct charge, you would then correct the charge. But at least in 23% of the systems, that wasn't the case, or at least it fell outside of the boundaries of, of we, what we considered a correct charge. And I think what we did was a pretty standard plus or minus three degrees subcooling for TXV systems and, and plus or minus, I think, five degrees superheat on a fixed metering device system. It just shows that you still have to do something once you take the measure, once you get the information out of measure quick, but shows that it's not the exact right charge. You need to do something to, to remedy that. Yeah, um, that could show that a good quarter or almost a quarter of those participants weren't prepared to deal with it or the homeowner wasn't prepared to deal with it because the corrective actions might have been either too much time or too expensive. Right. Some of the things we found were maybe there was one contractor who was pulling the average down for some of these. And so what we did was then give that feedback directly to the contract. And hopefully that resulted in an emphasis on training for certain employees or just overall changing the way that they operate their business. Like I said, this note was throughout the study. 
these results can be compared to the baseline studies when those are published in 2024, 2025. Looking forward to those ones. <clears throat> uh, and on the business side, let's take a look at some of this. Okay. Yeah, this is a good overview slide of what we found, which is overall 83% of technicians, contractors that we interviewed reported fewer callbacks with MeasureQuick. Once again, this was qualitative, not quantitative data, but they seemed to, that was, it was pretty consistent that they thought that they were getting fewer callbacks. And then slightly over half reported increased revenue per ticket. Every truck roll was resulting in more billable services. And, and then the other thing that we found was that it requires training. The respondent said, it takes time to learn and to integrate, but it's not trivial. And those were all things that I think we've expected to see, but it's good to see some numbers behind that. I'm also curious about maybe doing this again in the future. The question, do you know that your techs are actually using Measure Quick as design? Because mm -hmm. now, since all this study, Measure Quick's done all these upgrades to the software to catch a lot of those errors that, and to help the, the users through collecting the data accurately so that the results are accurate. But the, unless you have somebody shadowing them, are they <laughs> actually doing the workflows as prescribed? Oh, and then one of the questions was how it affects uh, maintenance agreements, that kind of thing. And what we found was the majority of contractors indicated that they had an increase in renewed maintenance agreement since adding MetricWick to their business offering. And some of the things that they found also were that 79%, that 80% of respondents indicated that it helped build confidence in the recommendation that they were making to customers. And that's something that we hoped for, but it's, once again, good to get some numbers behind that. Well, and then another thing I didn't mention was the, uh, the fourth bullet point here is that uh, the majority also said that the just-in-time education feature was helpful that they were using it. 80% said that it was impacting the technicians and installers work and that the majority were using it at least once per, per week. And that's good that there's some workforce development, some training built into the tool and it's actually being used. But we we're happy to see that. Oh, no, that's great. We're Again, I think that's why Jim doubled down on a lot of the features that he did, because getting that feedback, seeing that hard evidence that the just-in-time training inside of the app really makes an impact on you know, the technicians' lives, and also that it pro provides that confidence. The MeasureQuick team learned a lot from it as well. We're really grateful that South Face and MeasureQuick could work together on this study. And moving forward, do you see that... The tools like Measure Quick or a Smart Probe, Smart Tools, like how important are they going to be for the future of the industry? Well, we found that there's a need to improve the key performance indicator tracking of the contractors are doing. On the business side. Yeah, on the business side, yeah. And establishing better industry norms because we had trouble finding even what industry averages are. There's not a lot of sharing of that data going on. It would help everybody if there was a way to share that kind of data and lessons learned and, and best practices from a business perspective. That's one of the things that we found that Carolyn found from a huge a, black hole right now. <laughs> Given the state that this initiative ended in, do you think that it's going to be something where the industry will kind of start getting towards standardization or is it going to take a lot more work? Uh, already what we've seen within our organization and things that we're involved with, the green building programs, green building programs such as Energy Star for Homes are, are already starting to incorporate some of these new standards like ACA 310. And that's one of the workflows within MeasureQuick. And here at South Face, that's actually something that I've been approached at, uh, about is hey, we're starting to do trainings now. We're starting to train HERS raters and those kind of folks on how to do like quality installation verification. We know that you did this study with MeasureQuick. Can you show us how MeasureQuick works? Would that be a good tool to help with this? So I think the, the way that MeasureQuick makes that easier and streamlines it, I think that will help with the adoption of those kind of standards and help make that more mainstream. And then eventually, if it becomes more ubiquitous, I could see it eventually becoming a code requirement. I think that's what we'd like to see is it becoming something that is either so uh, routine and so easy that it becomes expected from customers 
or it becomes expected from a code perspective. I think either way, it'd be good. Yeah, I think it's definitely possible. Tools like MeasureQuick are making it possible. Without MeasureQuick, it's just way more difficult to do that kind of quality installation verification. Yeah, and for kind of the residential HVAC commissioning and retro commissioning, I guess that's the product category I would say that we're in. Now there's actually a couple because there's the mm-hmm. DNNL has their quality installation tool. I think XOI has some features there and so does Fieldpiece. Um, so luckily it's becoming a category that is being recognized as, as something that's necessary for the industry. Yeah. So we're hoping that with that growth of the category that a lot more people will start considering it. We'll see it as a necessity. And, and then that way we have just that many more eyes on these problems, these massive endemic issues across the industry mm-hmm. and more people working towards the solution. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, Brian. Thank you so much for your time today. It was wonderful getting to know you a little bit and learning about this very long title of a study, but very relevant study. So thanks for your work there. And hopefully we can chat again in the future about some of these other industry initiatives that reveal more insights about how we can do things better. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure.